Hello, everyone, and welcome to week three of the November Metagame Book Club. This is Track One Game Studies, and tonight we have, as always, Sherry talking about game based learning as well as gamification. So go ahead and take it away, Sherry. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, now I'm trying to see if that slide is showing up there. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so once again, this is this is that discussion on game-based learning and gamified learning. So so gamification, you know, that's also known as gamified learning in the education context. And yes, that's under game studies because game studies is a big umbrella term for a lot of disciplinary studies. So we're gonna and actually the the two images there. If you guys play Sims, that's that's where it comes from. <laughs> so we're gonna go next. All right. Um, so yes, there there were a lot of texts, but my intention was for you to select a text that might be more relevant to your discipline or fit your interests as educators. So uh, always, as always, my, my text seems very intimidating, but you're supposed to only select ones that, that you want to read. So I selected four texts in focus today. First one is Making Rights Decision, Artificial Life and Rights Reconsidered by Ju, uh, Ju Yong Kim. Number two is Adolescent Thinking and Online Writing After the Use of Commercial Games in the Classroom by Pilar La Casa and All in 2011. Uh, the third one is Pedagogy of Play, Integrating Computer Games into the Writing Classroom by Rebecca Schultz-Covey and Richard Covey um, in 2011. And the last one is called The Ethics of Indigenous Storytelling, Using the Torque Game Engine to Support Australian Aboriginal Cultural Heritage by Theodore G. Weld and all in 2007. The, fourth, the first three texts is actually about game-based learning, where you are actually employing uh, commercial games um, into the teaching, into the classroom. And the last one is still a game-based learning session, but it's actually a creation of a serious game. So we'll discuss all four of them in depth. So please go next. All right. So I placed three guiding questions to help us think about the text I'm going to cover. So first, as an educator, have you used any video game in your classroom? And if so, how did the video game support your lessons? The second question really is if you have not used any video game in the classroom, what concerns did you have that prevented you from employing games as learning tools? If you currently use video game in the classroom, um, please feel free to add to the comments what kind of concern you did have before you started employing games. Okay? And that last question is, given your student population, would your students readily accept video games as part of their education? Do you anticipate resistance to using video games as text, and why? Okay, so those are just the three questions. I think we can go next. All right. So that first text is Making Rights Decision, Artificial Life and Rights Reconsidered by Ju Yung Kim. The shot here is actually from Sims 4, and the reason why I place that there is because this particular text addresses Sim in the conversation about artificial life. Okay, so that's that's a plant eating a human being. <laughs> We're gonna go next. Okay, so on artificial life, gaming, and education. So Kim argues in the article that digital games in the simulation genre, such as The Sims, call on players to consider the relationship and interconnectedness between humans and machines. He finds that simulation-based digital games can help educators introduce moral education into the classroom. And here's uh, a quote from him directly. He says, since students are already engaged with artificial life, um, a life, environments such as online and video games, educators can use these interests to introduce issues of rights, responsibilities, and ethical dilemmas. Now I realize that in the last week we have touched upon uh, some of the article discussing moral and ethical issues in games. But I thought I also placed this one in there because Kim is discussing uh, moral uh, responsibility and ethics in, in the context of education and also it was very interesting to me that he was able to correlate this with current theories on artificial intelligence. Okay, So let's go next. 
Okay, and on a life and autonomy. So Ken identifies certain ethical implications of the creation of a life. The term a life generally refers to a human made life as opposed to nature made. Okay. However, the distinction between human made life and nature made life does not free us from moral and ethical considerations for either forms of life. There are several issues in a life development to consider. First, a life development emphasizes autonomy. An autonomous agent means in self, any self-organizing adaptive system which actively behaves to achieve a certain goal while in continuous long-term interaction with its environment. Okay, So it's able to make its own decisions, it's able to adapt to its decisions and make uh, and, and behave on its own. That is the general uh, understanding of what autonomy means. Okay, next. Uh, next. Thank you. Okay. So um, on a life sensations and materiality. So he borrows a quote um, from Sack and Suckman to explain the implication of a life. So he says, Sack presents a life as an example of aesthetic critique of AI. The aesthetic turn from essentialist objections toward neo cybernetic examination of the roles of the body the senses and perception and interactions with environment, however, produces ethical implications if we are interconnected with enough similar to us. By problematizing how the effects of machines as agents are being generated, Sackman warns us to keep an eye on a historical materialization of machines and consequences. So in this big section here, what they're really saying is that when we start to give material life to artificial intelligence, right? So when we say artificial intelligence, we're not talking about a body like a robot. We're just talking about the, uh, the intelligence that's generated based on uh, human actions, okay? So you can place it in anything, but the moment you place AI into a body and that body starts to give sensory feedback <laughs> to the artificial intelligence, then in that sense, it is very connected to the world, and also it's similar to us in the sense that we also are able to sense the environment, okay? Just like that uh, a life can do. So um, I'm going to go next. Okay, so on a life, cyborgs, and natural versus artificial. So Kim references Haraway's definition of cyborg to show the problem of defining a life through the natural versus artificial binary. So what I mean by that is when you say natural versus artificial, this binary, this di uh, diversification or, or bi bifurcation of these two realms is starting to be questioned by people who study a life. It, it is starting to, the, the, the categories are starting to shake, okay? So according to Haraway, quote, a cyborg is a cybernetic organism a hybrid of machines and organism, a creature of social reality as well as a creation of fiction. Cyborgs blur the binary between human and machine, science and social reality, natural and artificial and male and female. Haraway reminds us that trope nature through a relentless artifactualism means that nature for us is made as both fiction and fact. So let me explain that there. <laughs> A cyborg essentially, you know, through science fiction, we know that a cyborg is basically half robot, half human, so it has both of those features. So the introduction, when you use a simplistic dis distinction between life as in natural versus artificial, here comes a cyborg. Cyborg is both natural and artificial because it contains components that human beings make. So it is very hard to just say you belong in the natural realm and you belong in the artificial realm and dismiss them in that case. Okay, And it's also because it is created based on our fantasies. That therefore, Haraway says that it is basically both fiction and fact. And the word relentless artifactualism is relentlessly making things, making things in, uh, based on our creativity making them real, okay? In that sense, that's where the relentlessness comes from. So I'm going to connect all this. So don't worry if this sounds uh, pretty difficult, but it will be connected to the video game we're going to discuss. So please go next.
Okay, so now here's the crux of Kim's article. So the issue with a life and rights. Okay, so Kim references Inaya Tula's argument that a life such as robots should be given rights. Inaya Tula asserts, okay, that quote humans may see robots in their own rights, not only as mechanical slaves, produces and buy and sell, but also entities in their own rights. Denial of rights of robots, since they are considered other, as not sentient, and thus not part of our consideration, becomes of an exemplar of how we treat other humans, plants, animals, and civilizations. Robot should have rights not because they are like humans, but of what they are as themselves. So there is a whole dialogue right now that I'm kind of skipping, but ever since the introduction of the idea of artificial intelligence, there has been a discussion, a philosophical discussion, on how exactly we should treat robots if they do become sentient. But the argument has always been that because they are human-made, they are not nature-made, we really do not have to give them any rights. They do not need to be afforded any rights. But this argument here is essentially saying, well, using that na natural versus artificial distinction is saying that they are not quite like us. Using that dissimilarity as a way or as an excuse to not afford robots' rights, okay? But he is saying here that, well, essentially, because of the fact that they will be autonomous, just that uh, fact alone means that we really need to consider that robots should have rights as well, okay? And I'm going to connect this to the next part, so please go next. All right, finally, <laughs> all that discussion in the background of artificial intelligence and discussion around that. Now, A Life in the Sims, okay, so The Sims is a type of God game, and the God game um, uh, originate from Will Wright, okay, so th this idea, right, he, he was the one that created The Sims, and this term God game has been thrown around a lot. Basically, it's a game where the player can control their character's life. And Kim argues that the Sims can simultaneously serve as a simulation and examination of a life and human life. So here's another quote. By creating their own characters, players take up certain subject positions and exercise certain options that animate the Sims with stories from everyday context. The Sims leads players to examine their own lives by simplifying a complex real world into a micro world. The simulation game is an intriguing realization of a life. Now, for those of you who actually uh, um, been with us since the summer session of the Metagame Book Club, um, maybe you remember that we discussed this concept that games pr expresses procedural rhetoric, and also games are able to capture only parts of reality because it is limited, right? It has its rules, it has its constraints, and it can only simulate so much of reality. So in that sense, what they mean by here is that game, uh, it's the Sims simplify a complex real world because real world is way more complex than what the few shots of animation that we see on screen. And then we reduce it into a video game and in that sense it creates a micro world. But because of that extra focus on that micro world, it allows us to kind of see the conditions of what an A life uh, is like and also how should we treat that A life. So because of the simplification, we are able to see the issue more clearly than trying to see a complex world all at once. Okay, so next. Okay, now here's a big controversy. <laughs> the killing of simulated life in The Sims. So <clears throat> although The Sims provide characters with emotional states, so if you play the game, you'll notice that those uh, characters can feel happiness, sad, anger, a whole range of emotions. Some players feel little emotions or empathy for the life of their in-game characters. In fact, a phenomenon exists where the players enjoy killing their Sim characters. <laughs> Ken points to a post on the Sims discussion forum as example. So here's a direct quote from someone who posted on the forum, okay? So this person says, Sim killing is fun. Maybe you hate Brittany. Maybe you make a Sim like Brittany just, just so you can kill her. Fun. Anyway, because I am a Sim serial killer, I don't just kill my Sims one day. That would be so boring. So I've made a list of original ways you can kill Sims. <laughs> so this phenomenon is not just, it's not just limited to one individual. 
a whole group of people when they were playing The Sims 1, the first version, thought it was fun to kill those characters because they essentially are not able to relate to the character on screen even though they were supposed to have emotional states, right? So because of the emotional state, you would think that the player will feel some empathy for the characters, but they don't, okay? So if we can go next. Okay, I, I think we we probably those of us who play games and have been well, we haven't. I don't think any of us played Sim, The Sims. Um, those of us who have done Second Life and even World of Warcraft might be able to might be able to give a a slightly different view on that. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and and the reason and the, well, first of all. I should tell you, while well, this philosophical discussion is happening about, um, you know, AI and a life, we at Front Range actually did in our business law class, we had a, an assignment for the students that we built out of Second Life. And out of Second Life, um, what the students had to do based on the, the, the case law that they were looking at for an environmental um, business environment, legal environments of business class, what they actually had to do was look at a police report <laughs> of, of someone who was um, reporting that their World of Warcraft character was stolen, and then also from Second Life on whether or not that, that, they, had, that they had virtual rights over something that, that they had built in, in Second Life. So, I mean, even when it, when it comes to that, we decided to use that for a project for a class, and it was, and it turned out to be quite original because the students really had to argue both ways. What they had to do was they were a parent, we, and we do everything we do really at, at Front Range, what we try to do is put it in an epistemic frame. And it's really because if we put things in an epistemic frame, they're more likely to be adopted and to be found credible. So that means having the students act as if they were in that profession. So what we came up with was a was a email uh, an email that the students got. They were acting as paralegal interns and they were asked to do the first reading of of this this person who had had sent an email in and wanted and wanted the firm they were an uh, intern at to take the case. And the case was one that they were trying to get back their WoW character that had been stolen, but the police wouldn't listen to them. And the second one was um, the second one was about intellectual property rights and whether or not there was any basis of this in Second Life. So I mean, when it comes to the legalities of this, this is being discussed. This virtual goods, you know, virtual goods is a huge industry. Games are a huge industry, and what you're talking about, how people feel about whether they're in-game characters. Whether they're things that they've done designed in these games, these things are happening now. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm curious too. When you see, you know, this, the killing of their of these characters is. I wonder about the how these folks identify with those characters. Mm -hmm. Are they first person or third person? And I think there is a big difference when somebody says, "I," you know, in terms with the character that they're playing. Here I am. Oh, I am doing mm -hmm. such and so, rather than third person. You know, this out other thing or entity, but it's really not me. And those who identify and those of us who play games, you kind of identify with your character and you do a lot of I, oh I'm going over here, where are you? I am, you know, rather than she is or he mm -hmm. is. Well I think the other piece is, is also um, applying the the this idea of killing for fun. Um, to pets, like for hunters and warlocks in World of Warcraft. Uh, a lot of players will sacrifice uh, their pets to save their main character from dying. So <laughs> you, you see a lot of this where, where they purposely will send the pet in knowing full well the pet will die uh, because while the pet's attacking, they'll go sneak in and they'll loot the chest or they'll go and pick the herb or get the get the quest item or whatever and sneak out. So so I mean and or I've seen I've seen this, this happen with other groups where there will be the group sacrifice. And it used to be for, for warlocks in World of Warcraft you had to sacrifice one of your party members to get your summoning circle or to summon a a, a more powerful 
uh, creature to help help your group be succeed. So so people basically took turns to say, yes, I'll be the sacrifice, or I won't be, or or whatever. And you'll see now as well where people will run in, and uh, you know, on different cities, there's always somebody who makes a uh, interesting name, like it could be whatever the the mem celebrity of the of the week is, and they'll run into Ogremar, a, you know, a main enemy city or, or or Stormwind, and they'll purposely get themselves killed and they'll leave their corpse there, so everyone walks by sees a dead celebrity. Uh, so I mean, I, there's, there's there's all this stuff that people do uh, that that they play around with, and and yes, they do try they, they do uh, you know do it for fun or they do it for a variety of different purposes. I think Chris, your your example there, I think that at least is purposeful because I have to sacrifice to get something else, right? So mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> sacrifice the pet, and it's very purposeful, which is great. And also going back to what Gritter is saying about the, the I mean, there there are some arguments as well about that first person versus third person perspective. So that that um. I don't know if any of the text this week addresses that, but that is something to look into too as, as well. Is there a relationship between uh, player perspective versus empathy? And going back to, I'm trying to remember, <laughs> going back to Kay's example as well, I think what's really great that, that Kay brought up the epistemic frame, okay? Because essentially what she's discussing and what our role as educators, this is really what our role is, is to append a contextual layer so a video game offers context, but our job as uh, as uh, uh, educators not just to make the student play a bunch of video games and then go here you go you're learning. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> what we are supposed to be doing is applying that epistemic framework, that contextual layer, to give a perspective on how to interpret what's going on in the game. So that's layer upon layer of, uh, to help students learn. So that was a really great example there. I think you guys are going to like that next slide because it actually discusses the difference between Sims 2 and Sim 1. And the killing part where the player's saying, hey, it's fun to kill, that actually happens in Sims rather than Sim 2. So here we go. <laughs> Empathy for simulated life in Sims 2. So here's a quote. There, there's a couple of quotes. I just, I'm just going to read it off so you can see what happened there. So Kim says, due to the new features including reproduction, genetics and aging in The Sims 2, more often than not, most of postings in the thread, please don't kill them all, recognize the moral dilemmas created in The Sims 2. So here, the second quote is actually from a player who posted on that same form. Okay, so the player says, I don't think you should kill all of them, unless you really want to do that. You have to think about the consequences. Second, the remaining Sim will have that memory as a bad one will cry and you will end up with a ghost. Third, poor Sim. <laughs> so in this example here, what the, uh, Will writes, okay, the creator of Sims realized, and they, they've been reading the discussion forums, and what they realized was that even if the characters have an emotional range, because there's lack of a sense of consequence, that the players are more willing to kill off other characters just because they find them annoying or they don't like the character. But in Sims 2, because those characters can actually give birth, have children, have relationship, and the story gets expanded, all of a sudden the players start to feel empathy. They go, you shouldn't do that because you need to consider these consequences. So the game itself is actually generating more moral questions from the player by simply introducing a few more mechanics in there. Okay, so um, next. You know, I just have to say, I know, um, you know, a lot of these games, of course, there is combat involved and there is killing things involved. And I play with folks who, there are certain animals that you just, you know, they don't want to kill them. You know, like the turtles on the beach. They'll go kill the crabs, but they won't kill the turtles on the beach. Or they won't, you know, the fuzzy furry thing. They, you know, they avoid killing those kind, like the the scary monster with the horrible teeth and the crazy, you know, antennas or whatever that is unrecognizable to us might be easier to kill than a wolf that is, you know, kind of looks like a dog. Um, I mean, I've encountered that, you know, or, or completing a quest where, it, where you reunite a mother with its child wolf, you know, was really important to me, even though it didn't make any points. Um, so I, you know, there, I think it kind of does reflect who you really are sometimes. I, yes, I, I agree with that, and also. 
there also is, your, and Grid, your example, there also speak to a hegemony. A hegemony where we uh, uh, culturally value fuzzy things. <laughs> We, fuzz, we we this is this also tell us why and and especially why we select certain animals to eat and why we also kill certain animals we find certain animals cute and lovable so we think that it deserves to live and animals that are not as cute and lovable we decide it's food so it's actually pretty arbitrary but it also speak to our own cultural values okay so who we are is really also dictated by our cultural values right so I think it also speaks to the, the our, our, our cultural thinking as well yeah instead of snakes <laughs> yeah and, and if I could I could just interject for a second I think there's, there's something else that games is showing us when it comes to this and I'm just gonna put up my screen here real quick because this was something that has just been introduced in World of Warcraft but it's it's in other games besides World of Warcraft now what this is is actually followers so you know in World of Warcraft um, you are give, being given the assignment. You are now have a bunch of followers who can you can send out uh, missions. And and over the past like week since they've been introduced, we we've been debating them a lot. Like oh well, who's really good for you? And 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 what can and what can you use this person for? And I, I believe that Tanya was even talking about that that some of her followers needed a little bit of of you know like basically some a little bit of professional development or a little bit of mentoring to to make them better followers and and the thing of it is a lot of these games do give you whether it be virtual pets or virtual followers you know something that you are interacting with and it's and and think about how you've seen people who get very emotionally bound to to a character come on think of think of game of thrones and the and the blood wedding you know and and how everyone reacted to that well think about it if you, if you're playing with a character even even if it's a, a non-player character and you have it around a lot and and that's a lot what with, with what people collect in different MMOs and other games are pets that they have that mm -hmm. who they can end up getting emotionally attached to. Mm -hmm. And and your 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 introduction there follows actually very nicely to this quote from from Kim. Um, basically, he is saying that that moral dilemma that the players feels because they start to feel that the Sims are real. And I think the implication of Kim's article is because you introduce those genetic uh, uh, um, um, abilities, right, where the characters can actually create children, right, and, and, and uh, uh, get married and all, all that stuff, that you start to feel that they're more real. So therefore, we start to think about consequences because we get, we get attached to realistic characters, to realistic objects. So when it looks not as real, when it's more of a fantasy base, perhaps more we are more willing to kill it off or destroy it. Because I've done that in games too. I don't feel an attachment to certain characters or certain objects because they just feel gamey rather than feeling realistic. So that's very interesting there. And then one more uh, quote from a player. This player says, and this is just the second part there, I don't kill Sims that represents my family members and closest friends. No matter how much they make my life crazy or how much they annoy me, I couldn't do that. Especially not with Sims 2. That would just be wrong. <laughs> so in that sense, you, you can see that for, for this player, this player self-identify, right? Saying that I can't identify with those Sims. I mean, they are just like my family members, so why would I kill them? So in that sense, I think that Sims 2 did a much better job making us feel empathy for the characters just because it's more realistic. Okay? Thank you for that. And, and please go next. Okay. So I honestly, that was a wonderful article by Kim, but I, I just cannot cover everything. So I'm jumping into the second part, and I really recommend that you want to read through that article to get more uh, essence from the article. So the second one is called Adolescent Thinking in Online Writing After the Use of Commercial Games in the Classroom by Pilar, La Casa, and all in 2011. So this is a little more reason. The previous article was written in 2005. Now this image here is from the game Spore. We also talk about Spore in the summer session of the Metagame Book Club. And Spore is actually a game where you can evolve characters. You can give it special hands, you can give it legs, you can give a specific 
genetic coding and see what kind of animal you can breed. Okay, that's spore. So I'm going to go next. All right. So this particular article builds a lot on James Paul G. Semiotic Domains Theory. Okay. And Pilar, LaCasa, and all argue that video games can help students learn new forms of literacy in discourses, okay, and develop complex cognitive processes via game interactions. So not just the game, but the interaction with the game is where the cognitive development is happening. And they decided to do a study on how a teacher is teaching biology and evolution, uh, evolution using the game Spore. So it's a very interesting article. So I think we can go next. Okay. So this article has many, many, many skills that the game Spore can teach uh, the students. But I'm going to just point out the, a few main ones for you. Okay. So the first one, a science skill. So if you're in the sciences as a student, you need to be able to learn how to do inquiry. Okay. So La Casa and, and, and all argues that. Uh, educators can use video games to help students further develop the learning skill of inquiry. And here is uh, a dialogue that they actually recorded while they were sitting in the room with the teacher uh, talking to the student who plays sport. Okay, so the teacher says, "What do you think about this game?" The student says, "The game is cool, right? But I don't think that when people are playing at home, they think about the theory of evolution. But if you are playing in the classroom, then yes, you start to think about." Uh, you have to think, but when you're in another place, you are more thinking, ah, I will kill the stupid that, and not because I think that is the theory of Lamarck. Okay, Lamarck is one of the evolution theorists. Okay, this goes back to what Kay was saying earlier. So this is a really nice thread. This will be an example of what applying an epistemic frame does to the experience of playing a video game. Right. So this student says, you know, if I was at home playing this game Spore, I probably wouldn't, you know, connect it to evolutionary theories that, that we're taught in class today. But because I'm in a classroom setting, the context has changed, or there's a new context appended to the video game. I'm now thinking about video game in a different frame. Okay, so this is a really nice connection there. But you can see how the teacher is using that. And who wants and, to add? Yeah, I was going to jump in. Absolutely. Here's the difference between an teacher knowing the game and knowing their content and knowing where to connect it and actually being the more knowledgeable other this isn't about oh the students can the students can evolve their characters in sport much quicker than i am or or they have better fast twitch motion or you know they're they're better on the keyboard this is you as an educator looking at the game looking at your material and knowing where the connections are. And here's another reason why. We use Spore um, at our one of our campuses, but it was actually in a business class. And what they were doing is they actually used it. They weren't looking at the evolution part at all. What they were looking at is they were coming up with a, a, a new logo and a mascot for a product. And they had the students go in and they use it and they had the students use it um, when they were talking about how to market things and, and different things you could do with that. So Spore being used in just one session in a totally different way and Spore had a mobile app. So it was actually one of our instructors saw it at one of our our presentations we talked with the I talked with them just a little bit not long like 15 minutes and then one of their children um, got the mobile app and then started to play with it and then showed the parent but the parent who is the teacher was able to then make that kind of connection and I will tell you for making things like avatars we saw something like this in Second Life and the making and using how you can change the shape of the face, how you can change hands, it, it had nothing to do with evolution. Instead, it was used for a writing class where the students had to think about it was a one act play and they had to go into Second Life and make one of their characters, it didn't have to be their main character, but had to use the actual system of the game to make one new character. And that's really pointing to that new literacy because what we got back from the students from this writing course was that the students were saying, I never had to think about, you know, when I was writing this, how many freckles is this person going to have? 
exactly what was the tone of their skin. You know, what, how exactly tall, you know, I would just write they were tall, about six feet, but I did not have to think about it in terms like that. And that is really a new literacy where they weren't just putting in words what their character was, but they were, they were also doing a visual of what their character was. Was. And and that's where I really think that that we can we can do a lot more when it comes when it comes to games. Sit mm -hmm. down, think about them, play it, and see how they how they match our content area and you, content area and use them as tools. You know, don't have them drive us. We should be using them as technology as tools. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Wonderful. I love that. It's, it's in business, which is very unique. I wanted to also speak to philosophy educators out there. Um, there I, I think if you're listening to this, this webcast or watching this webcast, you probably already jumped to a, a particular area that this game can easily be used. If you use Spore in your classroom, you can actually teach the metaphysics of virtual environments or the ontology of virtual environments. So in the case of what I mean by that is, how does a virtual environment, specifically how it is designed, the object that's within that virtual environment, help generate emergent ontology, emergent being that come out of that environment? And that is a big discussion right now, an emergent ontology, that's a big, uh, big research area for game study scholars is how do virtual environments help us generate new kinds of beings okay and what does that say about our thinking what does it say about our future especially when we are creating you know the, the possibility of robots right do they all have to look anthropomorphic is there different directions that they can go so this you see the different discipline just like what Kay is saying depending on your discipline there's so many ways that you can use one game for many different disciplines the game does not have to be about evolution for you to teach in an evolution class. You can think of different applications for that game. Okay? So I think I'm going to go next. Okay. Another skill. Okay? Science skill, analysis. Um, so here's, I, I'm just putting in dialogues because I think the dialogues are really wonderful for you to see how it's working in that class. So the teacher asks, okay, we start with group three. What do you think that the game has to do with the evolution theories? Student, it shows, as Darwin said, that the strongest survive. Teacher, the strongest survive. But does it always happen? Is it the strongest who survives? Is it always the strongest? Is there another way to survive? Student, after there is the adaptation to the environment from Lamarck and the corroboration ideas from Kimura, okay? So the student, you see what's happening there is that the teacher is engaging with the student by helping them think about the video game in different ways that the student would not be able to, to do. This is something we already do, whether you use video game or television show or, or a novel. You ask students certain questions to guide them, just like how our webcast started, certain questions to guide our thinking about this issue, and you will be surprised where students can take that information. The student here is already analyzing, so analyzing, you know, dissecting the text to understand its meaning, breaking it down. And the student immediately connected it to two theorists, the Mark and Kimura, okay, on their theory of evolution, why we survive. So this is a demonstration. Now if we go next, here's another part to this. Okay, so we just saw analysis breaking text down. Now I'm going to show you how the students are interpreting what just happened. So again, video games offer context that can contrast with the limited context offered in science class examples. Okay, so with video game context, students have to offer their own answers rather than stereotypical answers that they could give because they expect normal science textbook or, or uh, you know, boring videos and whatnot. So here's an example. The teacher says, "Why do you mention Lamarck's adaptation to the environment?" The student says. Because it has to improve with each generation. In the way, in that way, the best can survive. Like the giraffe, which increasingly has the longest neck to eat higher things, such as ours, our creature in spore. It has the biggest mouth to eat bigger and stronger enemies. So this here is an interpretation the student made of spore based on uh, Lamarck's uh, theory. Okay, so you can see that this is a demonstration where the teacher can immediately figure out if the student even understood the theory at all. 
Because Susan says, okay, I'm interested. Now I'm going to apply this to understand that game. So the game becomes a context for them to do all kinds of um, uh, literacy skills that we want the students to do all along. Okay, next. Okay. So again, that was a quickie. There was a lot of skills, especially for, for science teachers out there. It is really worth your time to go through the article. There are so many, so many elements for you to consider. Um, but I'm going to go next to this uh, article, which is a pedagogy of play. Oh, I'm sorry, go, going back. <laughs> I didn't mean to say next right away, sorry. Um, a pedagogy of play integrating computer games into the writing classroom by Rebecca Schultz Kobe and Richard Kobe and it was written in 2011 and for those of you who play well that is you know from the video Miss Pandaria from World of Warcraft and indeed this article actually talks about how to use well to teach writing okay so next <laughs> thank you okay so on video games and critical thinking yes video games can help you with critical thinking so this is what they wrote here. They said, this research indicates that games are productive in helping students apply, synthesize, and think critically about what they learn through active and social participation. As a sophisticated and immediate interactive and conditional space of branching possibilities, or what Jesper Jewell in 2005 argued is a state machine. So video games are state machines. Okay? Computer games can offer teaching methods that help students learn through embodied simulation. Because computers can sustain simulated game worlds, they can be used to enhance learning through application within this simulation. So embodied, when we say embodied simulation, embodiment, which in, in the very general sense at the beginning, when we're interacting with a game, using our fingers and touching that pad, that is a basic level of embodiment. Body in. Now we all the way zoom into present day. Now we have Oculus Rift, which actually allows us the illusion to think that we're actually physically moving in that virtual environment. So this embodied simulation is very helpful to learning. So we're going to go next to see how she argues this. Kobe's argued this. Okay. So on play and meaning. So there's a relationship between play and meaning. Okay. And she and Richard Kobe. Um, decide to reference Johann uh, Hausinger, who we study extensively in the, uh, in the summer session. Okay, So sh they said, according to the historian and early game theorist Johann Hausinger, 1955, meaning originally leisure, school has now acquired precisely the opposite sense of systematic work and training as civilization restricted the free disposal of the young men's time more and more. School was considered leisure when only the upper classes could engage in it. After school became universalized enough to admit more working class students, school became serious work. Historically, the playfulness of learning for the upper class was readily apparent in ancient Greece where rhetoric has a history linked to play. Now, I didn't go into talking about Aristotle, which, which uh, uh, Kobe and Kobe actually go into the discussion. But notice the key phrase, that the, I mean, key sentence I basically highlighted for you. At the very beginning, education was for the wealthy. And the, and the, the wealthy class always thought of education as something playful, playful for them to think about possibilities. The moment we start to mass produce education for, for equally, right, for all types of, of children, all of a sudden, it becomes a factory worker mentality where we're trying to basically replicate the same kind of citizen at the education factory. So as educators, because we didn't understand this history, we seem to not understand that learning is essentially play. You play to understand how to learn. And learning, the process of learning, is playing in your head. Okay? So I'm going to go next. Okay. Now work and play, so on a connection, okay? Here's a, another direct quote. Even though this history of rhetoric offers a basis from which teachers and students can see the arbitrariness of the work-slash-play distinction, school and writing instruction have changed. Although one positive development in college missions is providing opportunities to the underprivileged, it has also been associated with the implicit goal of disciplining bourgeois subjectivity which in turn neglects activities not associated with serious self-improvement. Although productive play can be educational, 
this association causes skepticism. Nevertheless, imagining the classroom as a type of game space can further erase the work and play distinction. So you see, this is, why are we experiencing pushback? Um, for our group, at least in all the educators that we encountered at the Metagame Book Club, you know, we're, we're open-minded. We are willing to experiment with new medium because we can see the potential of video games. But I'm sure that it's not just myself, but others have experienced perhaps pushback from administrators, from other educators. And basically, Kobe and Kobe are saying, look, it's because we bifurcated this idea of work and play. Even though play isn't everything, we bifurcated that. Therefore, when you bring video games in, administrators and educators tend to associate video game with play which is separate from work and therefore they think that it is not an appropriate medium to bring into the classroom. Now I'm going to ask our, our panel, um, do you guys have similar experiences uh, with this? Yes, I can <laughs> tell you that just about anybody who, who has brought in game-based learning into the classroom knows that they usually have the loudest classroom in the hall. That, 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 no, and I've seen this myself. If I bring a game in, a game to play, it doesn't matter if it's my own class, it doesn't matter if I'm, I'm the guest, you know, instructor for that class. The class gets louder, the students get more involved, and, the, and then, and even when we're doing the epistemic frames, um, we did, we, we, we're doing Project Outbreak, which is a microbiology class, it just gets louder than when the lecture portion is there, and even when the lab portion is there, when they when they're breaking up to to do the to do the lab portion, that that this it definitely takes over a playful definitely takes over and movement takes over, and, and I do have to say about about the difference in in the classes, for me it's looking for students who can think more entrepreneurially. And so in solving problems, and can extrapolate from from one problem solved to the next problem solved. And I think, at least for me, giving them scenarios, having them play games, putting them in different situations, much like the the last reading that you just highlighted, taking them out of the usual does does make a difference. So that's that one part. Second part. Um, for those of us in Colorado, we actually, and, and I won't say exactly what the term is, but, but let's just suppose, um, we have this term for somebody who is giving a presentation on game-based learning and gets very skeptical and sometimes rude people in their session. And, and I'm not going to say the person's last name because we, it was that we all witnessed this happening to this person, and from now on, we, we uh, and I'm just going to pull out the name Bloomberg, Bloomberg like, you know, former New York City Mayor Bloomberg. But we have this term that, that we say, that we say, okay, are, are you sure? Have you gotten everything together? Have you done your research? Are you ready for all the questions? You don't want to get bloomberg when you go in there. And what actually happened was someone giving a presentation, and it was about the game Second Life, and somebody in the, the session, you know, said, well, the, you have a very pretty dolly there, but what does it really teach? So <laughs> I just wanted to say, those of us, oh, we are very used to this. And, and now the, I'm sorry. We'll go ahead. Um, those folks who have managed, as you said, the, you know, the administrators don't take it seriously. Those folks who believe in it and want to, you know, try as much as they can to get some game playing for teaching and learning into their classroom spaces, what they end up doing is having an after-school club, a mm -hmm. Saturday club. It's it's not the serious learning time, you know. Or can, we can't take this. Do we can't take serious, you know, class time to do this. But you can do it after school, or you can do it on Saturday if you like. Um, I mean, I've I hear the story again, and again. Mm -hmm. And I guess you know those are people who are daring and willing, and and eventually our hope and our advocacy is is one that this will be happening during the regular part of the instructional time, rather than just in a club after school that's not taken as seriously. There's a lot of people who have done that backdoor method of Minecraft has been one that's been brought in that way for a K through 12 World of Warcraft has 
um, at the community college and university level. Um, I'd have to say university professors usually have a lot of leeway. Um, so when they decide to bring something in, they can bring it in. Um, the way that it's been brought in in community colleges, a lot of time it is the extra credit assignment. Or, it, you know, and then it's the, okay, we'll give you two options. You can either do this project that's, that's based on World of Warcraft, or you can do this other project. So that's a lot of how things get, things get brought into the classroom, at, le at least for the commercial games. Thank you for all that. I, I, I'm glad I'm not the only one who's, uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm not the only one <laughs> who's experiencing all this. So yeah, so, so I hope that discussion there, and I think that the, uh, Kobe and Kobe did an excellent job talking about that history. And I really couldn't talk about the, uh, Aristotle that the issue with Aristotle and Plato talking about that it can go all the way back to antiquity to understand the problem of understanding play and we talked about earlier too which is Grid's example about you know not killing fuzzy animals and uh, killing animals are not as cute perhaps um, the same thing with this idea of play as eras change and as our value system change our cultural perspective change just like that epistemic frame it influence our interpretation of certain words and that's what philosophers do we look at words and the meaning of it and how it changes throughout history and play it was not this frivolous thing it was expected in education and I hope that educators can take that with them as they think about why we would do any kind of playing at all because that's what we're trying to get them to do okay so if we can go next Okay, so now they're talking about a, a greater idea about the classroom as game space, which some of us have already been doing as well. Okay, so uh, they argue that like a game space, a classroom is a magic circle. A circle, uh, a space bounded by turns and class periods and defined by its own set of classroom rules and learning objectives. With grades come the classroom's own rewards for teach, reaching objectives in the form of arbitrary points that have capital within the classroom space, but at least two students often seem to signify very little outside that space. Both spaces seem to be part of a magic circle that exists in a space clearly not a part of what usually gets termed the real world, but in a pure space. And I think among a few of us, we've been joking around about this, that the, the education is essential is a game. It's a giant magic circle, but it's not designed that well. <laughs> there are certain there are certain classroom where the students start to doze off or not pay attention. That's an indication that perhaps the classroom was not designed as a tightly woven, immersive magic circle where the rules make sense within that significant circle. Okay, but that's what they're talking about. So essentially, that's it, it is actually a magic circle, and that term once again came from Johann Hausinga, which is a play space. A magic circle is a pretend place for play. It's just another term for game. So we are doing games, we just won't admit to it. <laughs> okay? Um, so I think I can move on from this. Okay. So now, here's the crux of this article. They're going to connect War of Warcraft with writing. Okay? So Julian Dibble in 2006 and Edward Castronova in 2003, they've done research that have shown that the materiality of online game spaces such as well are often directly connected to the real world in the form of real goods and services that can be purchased to improve gameplay, creating a real world economic impact of $20 billion each year. Similarly, in the writing course we're proposing, students would actually participate in the WOW community, producing textual goods and services for that community that would also serve as academic assignments. And that textual uh, objectives achieved in both spaces could also have real-world significance. Now, I'm hoping that I'm trying to get Chris to speak a bit about this, because Chris have done amazing things with WOW and also uh, the auction house. And that's what he's expert in. So, Chris, do you want to add a bit to this? Sure. I think that uh, really it goes back to what Kay was saying, is that instructors do need to know the game well enough to pick out the epistemic frame that you want to go ahead and have the students look at. So for me, what I looked at is I really looked at the auctions ha auction house of World of Warcraft, and I looked at the crafting system 
that is available in the game. And so uh, really what you have in the game is you have a variety of different professions you can choose from, but you can only pick two. And so what the, what the students had to do is they had to look at and see, well, after spending some time analyzing and researching the markets and seeing the selling prices and seeing the trends, they had to select what would be their startup business if this happened to be a, a, a real-world scenario. So they were like, okay, so look at the different professions, look at what's there, and figure out. And World of Warcraft offers you a variety of different pieces from, uh, you can be commodities where you're going out and you're gathering natural resources like ore, uh, leather, uh, foodstuffs, different things like that. and Or you can also take a manufacturing uh, profession, which is then taking raw materials and you are processing them to create finished goods that you can go ahead and sell on the auction house. So you see here, here's the auction house. There's lots of things that are out there. And you can set your buy and sell prices uh, as you see fit. So what the students had to do is they had to come up with a business plan. So identify what were they going to do, identify what professions they were going to take and why. And then they are going to do ahead and figure out a uh, financial plan as far as looking at, well, what are my expectations when it comes to uh, what do I think, how much gold do I think I'll be able to make? And gold, silver, and copper is the numeric, uh, basically the currency denominations in World of Warcraft. And they're all basically units of 100. So 100 copper equals 1 silver, 100 silver equals 1 gold. Uh, and so basically the students would do that conversion. And for a month, because when you buy World of Warcraft for $20, you can buy the vanilla World of Warcraft and now they have they added extra stuff to it. And basically what it is is they can go ahead and they can uh, decide do they want to be a, a commodity, so supplier of raw materials, uh, so they can go out and be miners, be herbalists, be skinners, things like that. Do they want to be crafters? Uh, or the other option they had was to be a service provider, which would basically be, uh, you know, you would consider doing the game questing as being a service provider. You're doing a service two other players in the game or two NPCs, non-player cares in the game, and you're collecting a fee for your services. So you're, you know, you're a soldier for hire, basically. You go do the quest that you want. And so uh, students were able to grab a variety of different professions. They did have to take screenshots uh, of, off of uh, their transactions, and so they would, they would post that to a Flickr account, and basically they'd give me a link to their Flickr account. And so they had to document at least 10 transactions a week and they basically would compile, at the end of the four weeks, uh, they would compile their financial statements, they would write up a, 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 a synopsis of their performance, and they would reflect upon their business decisions and talk about what, what would they do if they could do it all over again. So, so really I picked this one small piece in the game, and it's not really a small piece, but it's a very large piece of the game, because there are people who play World of Warcraft who this is their game. The auction house is like day trading to them. Uh, and so they go out and they play. They apply those different strategies to the markets, and so the students could go ahead and talk about it, and then they could reflect on their work. And of course, this is in a business class where, where basically the final, the big projects for the students were to create a business plan, were to create a, uh, you know, do the proposal, write up a full business plan. And so basically, I had them do the same thing. The difference is, is that they had the option to use a game like World of Warcraft instead of basing it off of a, a real world business uh, that they may may or may not actually want to go ahead and, and start. So um, so that was really sort of the, the, the genesis of uh, you know me using World of Warcraft in a business class. But I've also gone ahead and done it for an accounting class as well because the same thing applies. You can go ahead, look at the transactions, process the transactions, and come up with a financial statement uh, and all the other financial statements that, that are not necessary. You can do that in these games. Uh, and it does make your makes makes for an interesting application. It makes students, you know, I had plenty of students come back to me and go, "I have never thought of games that way," and uh, you know, and, and I don't know if that was a good or a bad thing, but they, <laughs> you know, they're, they're like, "This is not a way. This is not a way I'm normally used to thinking about my games." Is in this business concept or in this marketing concept. Uh, and they could set their own prices. They had to talk about their pricing strategy. You know, why did you sell it for what you sold it for? Uh, what's, what type of pricing strategy are you using? Different things like that. So uh, really easy to apply lots and lots of business ideas and concepts to a game that has an economy 
Uh, and actually sort of what it is, is and if you don't like World of Warcraft, then what you do is you just tell the student, okay, you need, to pick an, you need to pick a game that has an economy. And what I mean by that is that other players are buying and selling. You're not just making 10,000 widgets and then selling it to a vendor at a set price. That's not real world. That's not what markets look like. What markets look like is there are buyers and sellers, they're always competitors, and someone's going to buy your stuff or they're not, and usually it's going to be based on price. And so it's an interesting lesson for a lot of our students to learn, and it's actually relatively inexpensive. You know, 20 bucks versus the average startup business uh, for those students who don't get the chance to try their skills, if you go out and try to start your business, you're looking at anywhere from fifty to $150,000 startup costs for starting your own business. And of course you can get, you get really more, really high if you're trying to do something like you know, start a restaurant or something like that. So, so it can definitely be a lot more expensive than that. And uh, and so those are things that that you learn, and it's and it's really inexpensive way to learning. It's only twenty bucks. Um, you know, majority of my students didn't have a problem spending twenty bucks. You know, they they griped more about having to go play World of Warcraft because they they it wasn't the cool game that was out there. Um, so it's kind of funny to see what's there, uh, but uh, it is just different things you can pull out of it. So I really think going back to the epistemic frame and making sure that your instructor knows the context. You have to know the game, and you have to play the game, because students are going to ask you questions, because even though I'm focusing on these pieces, students will kind of came to you all the time. Well, how do I, how do I move my character? How do, I, how do I talk to this person? Or how do I navigate the world? How do I pick up a quest? Or how do I do this? Or how do I do that? And so you always will get questions about gameplay, so you definitely want to be able to answer those questions. Right. Perfect. That was Thank you, Chris. That was perfect to show. Because the, the argument essentially here is that it is, the game itself is connected to real-world concepts. And Chris' example is that he, he notices those real-world concepts in there and uses it for his marketing class to teach students in, in that sense. So can you imagine that basically what they're proposing in the yellow is they want it to use the writing course to produce textual goods and services. So imagine if there's a combination of a business course with a writing course, it's a big combo course working together. I think that would be mighty interesting. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, and, that, and that's a piece we've always talked about. Is you know uh, a great a good example of of that cross you know pollination, if you will, is that you know there is there is a lot of a lot of correlation between students who have strong writing skills and their success in business classes. Uh, what people don't think about businesses, uh, business classes is even in an intro to business class, the very first business class you ever take, the majority of your uh, points are awarded for writing. You have to write reports. You have to write essays. You have to write minutes and notes, and and you really have to write up, you know, basically annual reports. Or uh, you're looking at writing up, you know, business plans. These large written documents. And if you if you and if you don't have a very solid Foundation in good grammar and <laughs> in good writing, uh, you will lose lots of points simply because you 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 you're a poor writer, and and mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I wonder why there is a lot there's a huge like typically most you know you know basically DWF rates is something that a lot of administrators look at, and what DWF is is the grade D, withdraw or fail, and and. Uh, across the nation, intro to business courses have phenomenally high DWF rates where students cannot transfer that credit. They fail that course. And predominantly, it is tied, it is tied to poor performance on written projects. And so it, it's interesting that I don't know if, there, if we have students who are self-advising and before they take their English comp classes, they go, well, I'm just going to hop in this business class. And and what happens then is that you you get into a class that is mostly writing, uh, you know most people don't think business is writing, but it's a lot of writing, marketing, writing. Most of your most of your medium is print advertising. So even now, I mean, you still do some video and stuff like that, but it's not good whenever you have misspellings in your print, you know, in your in your multimedia. So I mean, there's there's a lot of different things that you know the writing across the curriculum. Is and having having that 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 writing and composition piece plays an important role in in the other classes that aren't necessarily general transfer classes. Yeah, that's that's great. Educators, <laughs> think about a hybrid <laughs> course or, or or a combo course, right? Business and writing. I think that's a great marriage there. Perfect marriage, well, I think. 
Well, it's yeah. funny because we actually do have a business ready course, but the problem is it's a 200 level course. Uh, <laughs> so ah, you take okay. all your intro courses, and then you take a class to write for business. <laughs> Darn it. Ah, <laughs> uh, anyway, but you see, I recommend using Well. This this article is really saying the, the wonderful cases about Well. So there's your case. And I think we're going to go next there. And thank you for that, Chris. All right. Now, this piece is uh, pretty unique. Um, it is an article about a serious game. Essentially, I can't really find <laughs> screenshots or anything for the, the game itself because the article just discusses the, uh, um, the game. But, uh, the, again, this, this title is called The Ethics um, of Indigenous Storytelling, Using the Torque Game Engine to Support Australian Aboriginal Cultural Heritage by Theodore G. Weld and all. So what you see here, um, the image is actually water that's simulated. That's not real water. It's actually simulated water. So I thought just to show you the connection between simulation and what they're trying to do with the serious game. Okay, so next. Okay. So this is actually a serious game directly about the Australian Aborigines. And Theodore G. Weld and all, in 2007, developed a digital Sunlines game engine, a DSE, toolkit to simulate the way of life, environment, stories, and cultural heritage of the Australian Aborigines. The article details the designer's extensive efforts to create and implement a serious game that documents and simulates the life of real subjects. The complex process of making the serious game is worth our consideration and re-evaluation of the value of creating serious or epistemic games for education. Okay, so next. Thank you. So on uh, the importance of preserving and simulating stories. So here's a couple of quotes from the article. Stories are means by which knowledge and understanding is passed from generation to generation. As they live with such a close connection to the country and seasons, know it so intimately, the stories, songs, and culture are inextricably linked to the land. Aboriginal culture is still alive today with older people from the country still able to tell their stories. So this little quote shows you the importance of storytelling to their culture and how they preserve that culture. So next... The game-based virtual environments seek to explore the spiritual, mythic, magic, and superstitions of the landscape as a traditional hunting ground and hallowed place of worship. So what they're trying to do, and this is a grand task, if you will, they're trying to create that virtual environment to show those mythic elements, those magical spiritual elements, as well as real landscape conditions to try to preserve this. So on the surface of this, you might say, well, how can this be done? And I'm going to show you a few slides just to see, just to show you what they actually did to try to make this work. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so now actually on how they did this, on simulating and preserving the environment. So here's a couple of quotes. The features of the landscape and the fauna and flora contained must be faithfully reproduced in such a manner that the stories be told in this medium are closely linked visually and experientially with their country of origin. So that means we can't just make up a flower based on what we think uh, the flower should look, but according to their country of origin, what they look like from the original country. So they actually went and investigated the plants. And next it says, as ostensibly an educational product, if we create inaccurate environments, then interactors, not just users, with the product may be misled about a particular story or seen within a story. This has implications not just for knowledge acquisition and cultural maintenance for prosperity, but in, uh, um, in posterity, sorry, but in Australian uh, Aboriginal culture, then inaccurate telling of stories may affect the environments they refer to with de uh, deleterious spiritual consequences. So they're saying there that if you're not careful with every single element, we are actually going to demolish or actually destroy the story if we are trying to use the story to preserve the culture that we intend to preserve. Okay, so next. And Sherry, I can definitely yes. understand that. Um, when we built Bardo Tolo, uh, we were very, very specific, and we made sure, you know, that that we went back to the one inter the interpretation that we were using, and that we were very specific about which one. That that there were other interpretations of it, 
of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but the specific one we were looking at. Um, also, when we did an Egyptian product, it, an Egyptian Book of the Dead, I know you're going to think all we do is like the dead, but <laughs> when it came to that, we really... You really have to look at that, and and actually, it was one of the it, as you know, it was one of the more fulfilling things when when designing it that we had to get, we had to get so far into um, what was authentic rather than just you know doing doing a brushstroke over and going oh okay well this should work. It is important just because we are trying to respect that culture. And in, in, in this particular scenario, too, is that the, the authors admit that if we don't, if their culture is about storytelling and the context all matter to their story, and if we misrepresent them, we are destroying their culture, which is even more evil. So they have a big task on their shoulders for this project. So this next part is about those cultural objects that they also had to preserve. So they said, each individual plant and animal must be of the correct type and subspecies, and the narratological information associated with them has to be accurate and authentic. So stories around, surrounding those animals also have to be correct. For example, a totem animal or yurti, an animal of special significance, may have a recurring theme in a story told by a particular community. Therefore, it must be included. Different animals have differing significance in different countries. See? Context matters. Context always matters. So, game design in this sense for this serious game, they not only have to consider the spiritual elements that they want to address on the culture, but they also have to do lots and lots and lots of research to get this right. Um, because the context, if you get the context wrong, it doesn't matter if you drew an object, if the context shifts, then the meaning is lost. Okay? And next. Okay, and then cultural objects a little more. The Aboriginal children who participated in this exercise show real pride when they saw what the program represented. Okay, so they had children play the game after they made it. They were surprised at the rich graphics and interaction. Some felt it was a historical simulation. Others felt it related to a contemporary environment. Thus, a tool for empowering self-determination and overcoming negative stereotyping by mainstream media, it was instrumental in dismantling preconceived ideas of self-worth and image. The normally held view that somehow indigenous peoples cannot do this kind of non-indigenous high-tech work. So I respect this project a lot because, first of all, this connects to our week one discussion about representation, gender representation, racial representation, and video games. It does matter to represent accurately. It does matter to represent a gamut of people, not just a few uh, represented uh, minorities or uh, popular one majority. So these minorities who are usually not presented in video game through the serious game design, they were able to be represented by over, you know, and and uh, ignoring the stereotypes that's been in the media about them for a long time. So I think this was a wonderful project. But also just to add on to this too, if you saw this, those steps that I've shown you, serious game to make of this nature, it is not that easy to make. And we had discussion in our group, as well as other educators have discussed the problem of serious and epistemic games, which is that they fall into the problem of it's not fun enough, it's not accurate enough, and part of it is because it costs a lot of money, a lot of research hours just to get it exactly right. So if, if they can do it at this extent, I have absolutely no problem with serious or educational games. But if you're not doing it at this extent, you know, it, it's very hard for serious games or, or, or educational games in that sense to fairly represent or, or show the issue and also be fun at the same time. And fun in the sense of Jesper Jewell's definition of fun, you have to consistently offer challenges. Challenges that build on top of each other, that scaffolds on top of each other. So the next level, the challenge is harder than the level before and it consistent allows you to have that sense of flow so that the, the levels is not too hard but just right. Those are very difficult elements to, to, to design for any educator or for any game designer. So when you mash those two elements or two, two domains together, 
sometimes the conflict of the two domains does not create the best products, and this is where the fear of uh, some of us educators are afraid of those serious and epistemic games ruining the learning experience versus using a commercial game. But in this instance, I really have to say, though, that I do respect the amount of work that the authors try to do to make sure that they get it right for the people they want to represent. Okay? Um, so I think next. Okay. Now this part I kind of want to leave for the panel. Um, I did do a presentation uh, a while back and it was about how I use uh, the digital game based learning method to teach philosophy and rhetoric. But without going into that first, does the panel have anything else to add regarding this topic today? And we don't have to cover that as well either. <laughs> I don't have anything at the moment because I think you've been doing a brilliant job of it so far, but whenever you want us to jump in for comments, let us know. Okay, okay. I am not going to go through that whole presentation. I just want to show like one or two slides. So, um, Chris, if you can go to that slide for me, it's going to take you some, some work there. If you click on that link, actually the link itself on, yes. Okay. And you can blow it up for us so it's a little bit easier to see. <laughs> now, this particular presentation, I, I really, and you can just scroll through this. Um, what I was trying to do with this presentation is to show that we really do not need to use, um, uh, you don't have to. I mean, you can, but you don't have to use serious and epistemic game to teach. Um, and also, our panel did an excellent job showing us that you can use a variety of these commercial games, right, to teach just about any discipline. We gave you science, uh, uh, example of science education, business education, there's the writing course, and from my end, the philosophy and rhetoric, which I use it extensively. So I think, and if you, uh, and Chris, if you can go maybe one more or two more there. Okay. I just show, uh, show you really quick, okay? This one, this one game is called A Duck Has an Adventure. <laughs> it's a commercial game, and it's free, so you don't have to pay for this. This is actually a flash game, um, and what this is is on Armor's game right now. And what this game is is actually an interactive fiction, okay? And it really is just about duck. It is not intended for education. But when I looked at this game, and if Chris can go next for me. Okay, great, thank you. I started to think about how to teach audience assumptions and rhetoric through, through the rhetoric of this game, okay? And just as an example, um, I asked them the question, determine who is the audience for the game of Doc has an adventure. So one, who is the audience for this game? What would the audience need to know in order to get the joke? Okay, so there's jokes in this game. What game signifiers, text, or images offered you clues of who the audience would be? Now, I ask this question because in, uh, in a writing course, and this is for my writing course, okay, for my advanced writing course, the students, we give them a lot of, you know, literature, classical literature, and also New Age literature where they're trying to understand how to dissect the, the semiotic text, right? So they're looking at the linguistic text and figuring out how to dissect that text. And we also ask them, who is this text written for? Who would be the one who can understand the complexity of the text or care about the issue that's said in this text? Now, I gave them this video game because, well, just like we talked about a shifting of context, this game is outside the norm of normal text as written in an academic sense. It's actually a game, it's very funny, there's actually an uh, issue about uh, uh, marriage and also divorce and also romance and also drunkenness, <laughs> also failing out of school, all kinds of area this game covers, okay? So I asked a student, taking them out of their comfort zone, I said, look, this is not your traditional text. So you tell me after you play through this game, who do you think this game is designed for? Who would understand some of the issue in this game? Students would be able to tell me, but most of them actually identified. They said, you know, student, uh, young children, maybe below the age of 13 or so, wouldn't be able to really relate to some of the issues in the game. Because there are certain parts where the duck go on an adventure and he got drunk 
and downtrodden and couldn't find a job. So some of those children would say, I don't really care about this. <laughs> so for the adults, this is really an adult game. Okay, so that's an example. Another question I asked the student is, while playing, what assumptions did you make that were later subverted by outcomes in the game? List your assumptions. So assumptions are things we believe, okay? Whether they are true or not before we have evidence to support our beliefs. Now, assumptions are not evil by themselves. Assumptions is, um, for example, I meet an individual. The first day I meet this person, I make certain assumptions about that person. I assume that this person would be nice to me. I assume that this person will say hi to me. I assume that this person can speak English. I assume that this person can have a conversation with me. So those are examples of assumptions that's happening constantly in our head that does not have to be negative. Okay, so I asked a student in class and I said, can you list out some of those assumptions when you started playing the game in the first place? So I stopped them in the middle of the play and I tell them to list out some of the assumptions that they have about what the duck is going to do next and what's going to happen to the duck's life. And after they play through the game, and it takes me usually about 30 minutes or so, they play through the entire game, they start to check whether their assumptions about the duck was correct based on the outcome that they have received. So this is one example of how you would use a commercial game to teach um, assumptions. And maybe I'll do one more. And uh, Chris can go next there for me. Oop, not there. Um, in the middle. There you go. Thank you. And I think I'm going to skip this one. So next, next. Okay. I'll do one more and then I'll stop. <laughs> This game is called Nothing You Have Done Deserves Such Praise. It's actually an art game, and it's actually very um, ironic and very critical. So it's uh, what you do is when you're playing through this game, the game constantly tells you, you are wonderful as a person, you're great, you know, everything you do is perfect. So you play through this game, there's no obstacles no difficulty, no challenges. You can't die in this game. So you keep on jumping through the game and you try to see what happens. But the students who are playing this game gets really frustrated. They go, wait a second. So this game constantly tell me that I'm wonderful. So what's the point of this game? I'm not winning anything. I think I'm winning through the whole thing. This is a weird game. So I asked the students some of the questions like, about the game's uh, uh, pathos. So pathos and rhetoric means appeal to emotion, empathy, or relatedness. How does this game make you feel something? Okay, so one is provide verbal, audio, and visual examples that express the game's pathos. What kind of pathos does the game express? So the students sometimes will break the text down and go, this is the kind of words I see on the screen. This is the music I hear in the background. And the visual object on the screen make me feel so and so in this way. And I would ask them, why does it make you feel this way? Can you tell me about some of your cultural context or related to certain cultural values that made you feel a certain way about the audio, about the object, about the things you see? Okay, so that's part one. Question two is, what is the main claim of the game? Do you agree with this claim? So main claim is another way of saying the thesis statement. What is the game trying to convince you to believe? And the game essentially is very flippant about it. It's actually making fun of this idea of uh, uh, a certain type of American thinking, which is, um, you know, that, that I am perfect. <laughs> we, are, we are the best, okay? We can make no wrong. You know, I deserve everything. This, this new generation. I'm not saying all Americans. I'm no, no, no. I, I mean, we have American exceptionalism in there. Um, <laughs> we have, we have the, the Mr. Rogers theory, you know, <laughs> syndrome yeah. that, that everyone is a unique snowflake. And, and and yeah, I, and and I did get to play this game. I w I was at Sherry's session, and the game is beautiful. I would say just go for the graphics, stay for the learning. I mean, it's a it's a beautiful game. Great, I, it's an art game. It is an art game, and it really is. It really is not there. And this is an example of a game, an art game, where it doesn't care to satisfy the needs of the player. It is not in a very commercial game of the sense that commercial games tend to please the, the player, what we want, what we desire, what we think is fun, right? So it's designed in such a way. But this game doesn't care. It's just trying to speak a message to you. It's saying that we think too highly of ourselves. We need to be humble. <laughs> So the whole game does not give you the satisfaction. It doesn't allow you to feel gamey. It just let you go through a series of procession. And not only that, 
as you progress in the game, the music gets way louder, and they keep telling you, you're awesome, wonderful, stupendous, to the point when it becomes unbearable. It becomes annoying that you're complimented over and over again throughout the entire game. Okay? So, yeah, the, the pathos is to support the main claim. So I just show you really quickly two examples of games that I use, and those are free games, okay, so you can find them easily online, to teach rhetorical principles. So this slide, the link to this slide is in this presentation, and it's also actually on our week page, so if you're interested, you can certainly click on those, the links are all uh, in the slides. Okay, and that's it for me for today. Okay, I, I just want to, I just want to say, Everything I'm saying now, you deserve the praise, okay? I want to thank you for, and anybody else jump in as you want, for three phenomenal weeks <laughs> of this game, of game studies and game-based learning and everything that you covered over these three weeks. I mean, seriously, you went from, from Gamergate to <laughs> digital games and ideology to this week really looking looking at game based learning and, and how it can be used and and I just have to thank you so much for this and and I know I think we've almost tricked you into coming back in March right I, I think for, I'm coming back in March. <laughs> okay, for, for gamification, because I, I know that you did put some things on how, on gamify um, in this week's reading, but like you said, it, we could go over hours of it. So um, just be, on behalf of the whole metagame <laughs> crew, um, ISTE's Games and Simulation, and Inevitable Instructors, thank you, thank you so much for doing this with us. Thank you, everybody. Um, this presentation was excellent because everyone contributed thoughts about those slides. It was very wonderful today. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to say goodbye, and this is it for 2014.